This is your reality check. Hi everyone and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. I'm Christina Roach and this is the show for May 17, 2020. We have a couple of great segments for you recorded by Adam and Darren Solo since we're all still in quarantine mode. Adam kicks things off by addressing some listener email around Apple and Google's contact tracing efforts, and then fact checks claims that body language can indicate someone being a quote-unquote beta male, whatever that is. Next up, Darren dives into the world of cyber war with a great overview of the perfect weapon from author David Sanger, a fascinating inside look at how the rise of cyber weapons transformed geopolitics. He also brings us his own critique of Ronald Purser's McMindfulness, how mindfulness became the new capitalist spirituality. Enjoy, and until we talk to you next time, stay classy, not smartassy, and please stay safe. What's up, cuboids? Before getting started, I wanted to give a quick update about the segment I did a few weeks ago on how your phone can track you. Now, at the time, I mentioned that new applications were being developed by Google and Apple, which would use Bluetooth contact tracing to track the potential spread of COVID-19. Well, since then, we've gotten contacted by a few people who had the same criticism about this segment. Now, both of them happened to point me to the same Security Now podcast, which looked in depth at the technology used for that contact tracking. I encourage you to check out that podcast, episode 762, which is linked in the show notes at trcpodcast.com. I hadn't heard this when I originally prepared my segment, as the episode was recorded on the same night that I recorded my segment, and I don't have access to a time machine. But basically what this discussed was that Google and Apple are working on a protocol, not an actual application, and this protocol, using low-energy Bluetooth, would allow for applications to do such things as contact tracing for an infectious disease. In this case, COVID-19 is the one that people are worried about. Now, I won't get into the specifics, but basically the identifier which is shared when you are in close contact with another person is sufficiently meaningless and changes regularly enough that they can't be traced back to you as an individual person. Applications using this will still be able to send out an update that you may have been in contact with an infected person, but you won't be able to tell who that person actually was. The spec for this protocol does seem to be quite secure, and the people on the podcast made this determination. They know more about it than I do. Now, this is set to be out in mid-May, so it might be out by the time this podcast is released or by the time you hear it, but applications haven't been released with this yet. So we really don't know if some other security vulnerability may exist in the applications themselves. Should you have opted in to use these applications, perhaps your COVID-19 positive test status, as determined by the application, may be shared with someone. This could be a feature, not a bug, depending on who writes the application. Australia already has a coronavirus tracking app. Well, how is this possible? Well, they don't actually use the new protocol that's being written by Apple and Google, though I suppose it's possible that they will update the app to use it in the future. Probably depends on how much work that would be. That would allow the application to work more passively on Android phones where it is currently installed and run on iOS, like your iPhone device, which the app is not currently supported on, so it has a a smaller install base because of it. So is this a big concern? While some security experts have looked at the application and have found no real concerns with it, the UK is is developing a similar app, and though they started developing it before the Apple and Google protocol was announced, they are planning on incorporating that into their application. We expect that many others will follow. Now, a common sentiment expressed to me by listeners was that COVID-19 contact tracing applications were important, and that if what I said might potentially discourage people from using them, I should offer some sort of correction. That's completely valid. Now, since many applications have not yet been released, I can't make a specific recommendation one way or another. I just want to give you the information and let you make your own decision, even if at times my own thoughts aren't that well hidden. As I've mentioned before, security is always a trade-off between convenience and risk. You can't use your phone as a phone without being traced somehow. So you just got to find where that medium is for you. Fighting COVID-19 is important, and you have to prioritize this against the potential privacy risk of using such applications. And as of now, we aren't aware of any security concerns with the protocol that those applications will use or the applications which use similar technology. It remains to be seen what the risks with specific COVID-19 tracking applications will be, but the benefits are certainly there. Hey, fellas. Have you ever been with a woman and basically not been standing completely straight, maybe leaning a little bit towards her? 
Well, some people believe that this shows that you are weak and needy. Basically, a beta male. Now, I first heard about this recently when a post by Twitter user at Alpha Rivolino went viral. He shared a photo of strongman half Thor Julius Bjornsson, who was leaning into his wife. And green lines were superimposed on the image to show just how inclined he was. So basically, the line goes through the middle of, you know, where his spine might be. The photo came with the caption, Don't lean in, strong man. Now, he's currently considered the world's strongest man, as he was the winner of the last three Arnold Strongman Classics. Listeners may recognize him from his role as the Mountain in the TV series Game of Thrones, and this man is massive. He is 6 feet 9 inches tall. That's 206 centimeters for our metric friends. He weighs 452 pounds, some 205 kilograms, and his wife, model Kelsey Henson, is 5 foot 2, 158 centimeters, and weighs 117 pounds, 53 kilograms. Haftor is indeed leaning into his wife in this photo. She's actually leaning away from him based on the green line, which is drawn through her in this photo. He doesn't exactly come off as a beta male, as the saying goes. Now, these weren't the specific words used in the tweet, but these were some words that some people used in describing it. Now, there's a lot to dissect, and I'm not sure I can do all of it justice, but there are a few things at play here. Rivellino is into the PUA or pickup artist community. Now, I don't believe him to be a terribly prominent figure in the community, as I couldn't find much information about him. And I didn't dive too deep into his life and Twitter history, but amongst other things, he recommended a book by Mystery. That's a famous pickup artist known for his mystery method. Many years ago, I read Neil Strauss's The Game, an exploratory nonfiction, though probably a bit exaggerated, account of Neil Strauss's time infiltrating and being part of the pickup artist community. Strauss befriends mystery in the book, and a lot of what he suggests is part of this mystery method. So The Game and other PUA writings span all sorts of things, some of which are sort of common sense, some of which are practical, and some of which are complete pseudoscience. Some of it is also fairly disrespectful of women. Now, at its best, the advice is simply to make yourself into a better person, make yourself attractive, and have confidence. I imagine a lot of listeners are likely repulsed by the idea of pickup artists in general, and some of the negative things that have been associated with this. That's not to say that it isn't logical that some of the things espoused by these pickup artists could work. It is logical that if a lot of people try a lot of things and focus on what seems to work and discard what seems to fail, that some of the things which they believe to work actually work, at least a little, and at least on some people. No doubt there's also a lot of nonsense in the PUA world. Just like meaningless rituals done by baseball players just because something is repeatedly done by someone who thinks that it's been working doesn't mean that it's actually been doing anything at all. One of the nonsense things in the book was about NLP or neuro-linguistic programming. This is a scientific sounding way of using physical cues to read people, teaching you ways to persuade and also hypnotize people. It's actually a bunch of things, so it's hard to describe too simply. One example of NLP is trying to be able to tell if a person is lying by the direction which their eyes look when they make a statement. These kind of things are popularized on shows like The Mentalist and Lie to Me. I've never seen Lie to Me, but I watch quite a bit of The Mentalist, and he often tries to kind of read what people are saying and do lie detection, things like that. I talked about NLP in depth on episode 109 of the podcast back in 2010. That might be worth revisiting at some point. Rivellino elaborated a bit about leaning in, saying that it is sexual polarity. Like a lot of pickup lingo, here is a scientific sounding term, but that doesn't mean that it's actually evidence-based and that there's science behind it. He says, and I quote, The feminine wants to lean into the masculine. She wants to enter his world, feel his strength, feel his protection, and submit to his guidance. Sexual polarity is the foundation for sexual attraction. Little fire emoji. Sexual polarity is the foundation for love. Heart emoji. A bit of searching showed that Tony Robbins also talks about this. Tony Robbins is also a proponent of NLP and some other things that are pseudoscience, and also some things that are just basic common sense. He explains that everything is about polarity and that sexual attraction always involves opposites, so a masculine versus the feminine. A lot of this is a sort of self-help kind of stuff. So while it may be true that in many cases the masculine is attracted to the feminine or vice versa, this is of course not universal. And I don't know if we can necessarily apply this concept too liberally to the concept of leaning in. Is the act of leaning in really such feminine behavior? Perhaps at times, but certainly not always. Examining leaning in is really just trying to use some physical indicator to measure something. In this case, it's a type of body language. Well, is body language a real thing? Well, yes and no. 
A person expresses themselves through body language in many ways, and other people can easily recognize this a lot of the time. There may be people who are more perceptive to certain types of body language. That said, when you try to quantify body language, this often becomes difficult and unreliable. It's not to say that certain physical cues may not correlate to something, but you may not be able to do anything useful with this data. So I may look at a physical trait or even posture and get, say, a 60% correlation to something, and that may be scientifically meaningful or interesting, but it's not necessarily useful to assess a single case. In the case of most body language, the problem is always that many physical actions or poses can have multiple reasons for which they might occur. If a person crosses their arms, they may be uh, closing themselves off, as people say, or being defensive, but they might just be cold. They might not have pockets on that particular jacket or pants they have. That person may just be more inclined to cross their arms, just a habit that they have themselves. Some context of the person, the place, the temperature, and many other variables may help, but can't tell you something definitively. So maybe I could do a scientific study on a bunch of people answering some questionnaire and correlate arm crossing to openness to an idea or something of the sort. But unless it's 100% accurate, I can't infer anything about a single person if I see them crossing their arms. Similarly, there are a lot of reasons for which a person may be leaning in. Do women do it more than men? This could be possible, and this might just be because, on average, women are often shorter than men. No doubt posture is important. A person standing up straight may seem stronger, more confident. It may be a man who's puffing themselves up to try to impress a woman or something like that. A person slouching may seem the opposite in many ways, and leaning in may look like slouching. So in many cases, it may look bad to lean in, but there may be other reasons. This isn't really gender-specific. A woman having nice posture is going to have all the same benefits as a man having nice posture. In a lot of the examples given by Rivellino, these weren't just couples out and about being photographed. These were posed photos. There's a photo of Neil Strauss, for example, with his then-wife Ingrid, whose relationship is a key part of his 2015 book, The Truth, an uncomfortable book about relationships. I talked about that on the show. I wasn't crazy about it. In the photo, her head is tilted away from Neil, and the suggestion is that this is meaningful. They divorced in 2018. And the idea is because he's in that community, people who see this photo might already know that history. But perhaps there are many reasons for which she tilted her head, including what the photographer asked her to do. Maybe she took a bunch of selfies and she saw that tilting her head like that made more sense. Maybe her head was tilted towards him and then they changed places. Who knows what happened in this photo shoot? In the case of the original Half-Thor Julius Jornson photo, they're posing for photographers at an event. Now, just speculation here, but it could be that Half Thor didn't know much about what was in frame for the photo and was just leaning in to make sure his face was in the shot. I see photos like this all the time, especially when they're taken of large groups in crowded places. So the person taking the photo asks everyone to crowd in, and with a lack of much space, everyone just kind of leans in a few inches as if that'll make a big difference. And the photo looks kind of terrible because everyone is very awkwardly leaning towards the middle of the frame of reference, and then the photo ends up including way more in the frame, and it doesn't look like there's a good reason for everyone to be leaning in this small amount. It's a bit of a pet peeve of mine, but that could be the kind of thing that's going on here or with other photos where people are leaning in. So much to say, there's nothing about this particular photo in which Havthor Julius Mjornsson looks feminine or submissive or that suggests that there's any reasonable basis for this don't lean in philosophy. When it comes to perception or just posture, it may be a good idea to try to stand up straight, but there's no evidence that it's a meaningful indicator of relationship satisfaction. That said, now that this leaning in idea is out there and people are talking about it, though often mocking it, we may see people becoming more aware of how people lean in. This could, theoretically, in turn lead to others to react negatively to men leaning in, which could lead to, say, a woman finding a leaning in man to be unattractive or a man seeing another man as being weak for leaning, which could impact his place in the pecking order and negatively affect his status and all sorts of things like that. So that last bit is speculation on my part, and I don't expect this particular meme will be all that meaningful, but things can become complicated when a perception is all that's needed for a person to make a judgment on someone. Similar, since we're talking about the world of pickup artists, once these pickup artists started getting these tricks and they started to work, but then they started to be used by too many people around the same area, the women in that area became wise to them and reacted to them. So there's never really a perfect uh, trick for anything. Leaning in is not likely a strong indicator of relationship satisfaction. One could research this in many ways, such as by looking at photographs and asking people a simple questionnaire about how their relationship is going, or even asking about recent sexual interactions. But I'm not aware of any such research having been done. In any case, even if there was such a correlation, it wouldn't be useful to assess individual instances with much accuracy, 
because as with all body language, there may be many reasons for which a person may lean in, and I don't believe sexual polarity is a major factor here. As for Havthor Julius Bjornsson, I think this three-time Arnold Strongman classic winner and celebrated actor can safely lean into his model wife with his masculinity intact. All that said, watch your posture. Slouching is a bad habit, which I'm guilty of doing all the time, but you'll probably look and feel better if you just stand up straight. Peace out, cuboids. Hi listeners, hope your experience of blurred space-time is at least as good as mine as one day seems to be like any other, as we are still largely in lockdown and isolation here. I've had a chance to listen to lots of audiobooks while being at home, so I thought I'd do a quick review of two of them for you now. One is about Cyberwar, and the other is about mindfulness. I thought they'd make a nice pairing, Cyberwar and mindfulness, together at last. First book, The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear in the Cyber Age, by David E. Sanger. This is a great book. It is certainly about war, sabotage, and fear, and he provides a nice overview of key issues and events in cyber warfare. Nailed it. Book review done. If you already follow the issue of cyber war and the hijinks great power states get up to, then there won't be much new in here, but I enjoyed his explorations of the Iranian centrifuge hack, the Stuxnet virus, Snowden, the DNC being hacked, uh, Sony being hacked, Facebook election stuff, North Korea's machinations, and so on. Now, in general, as a aside here, I tend not to read the news much aside from skimming headlines because I don't think it is the best use of time, and it can give one a false sense of the base rates of various phenomena that occur. For example, homicides are reported more than suicides. Very few suicides are, for good reason, because then there's more copycats. But then one might think suicides don't happen much at all. Not true. And I think that generalizes to many, many different things we might read about. Far better to pick one or two stories or issues and then go in-depth. But there are so many different issues. What to do? Can't follow them all. Well, one solution is to read a book about recent history. Aren't all books history books in a way? The Perfect Weapon came out in May 2019 and provides nice summaries and some analyses of the events I just mentioned above. And I find the context and linking all these related events helpful because I've listened to all of them at the same time with a general theme and purpose in mind. In terms of some key messages that will stay with me from this book, uh, Sanger emphasized that A. It can be difficult to determine who is attacking you in cyber war. B. If you do know who attacks you, and then you reveal it, you might give too much information away to the enemy. And C. It is hard to determine a proportional response, especially compared to conventional warfare. So, to briefly elaborate on all of these, it's just not that easy to tell who's doing what to you in this world of cyber espionage. There are different uh, actors and systems and electronic devices that can be leveraged and utilized in different parts of the Earth that makes it very difficult to fully know who did what. Now, there's often a fog of war in general, but here I think the difficulty is ramped up even further. And then B, about how much you reveal, this is common and uh, much a part of the general spy game that's been played throughout history. If you are snooping on the enemy and you use some of that intel, then they might know you're snooping on the enemy. So what to do? All to say, another layer of complexity. And the one I thought was most interesting is that it's hard to determine a proportional response. Well, in the past, if someone sunk one of your boats, you might sink one of their boats. Maybe about the same size boat, maybe slightly bigger, but it generally be a boat for a boat. That makes sense. When a different state messes with the banking system in your own country, what do you do? Is this like them sinking a boat? Is this like someone, a neighbor, blaring loud music? Do you send a missile? Do you send a warning? Do you something similar? Also, because he's an American writing for an American audience, the U.S. government does not have the responsibility to protect, say, a bank's physical building. The U.S. government is not going to hire the security guards to guard the bank. But when the banking system is under attack, are they responsible? Maybe? Somewhat? Slightly? Yes and no. Depends on the severity. Same thing with other issues of social media and whatnot. The U.S. government did intervene in the Sony hack, and that was related to that silly Seth Rogen movie about North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un, because they saw it as attack on freedom. But you could make a case that many of the attacks that are experienced from other states are problematic. Now, if you're a private company and you're very powerful and you're experiencing tax all the time, which apparently Facebook, Google, and the like are, what do you do? Well, it's not legal for you to actually respond in kind. You can only defend yourself. And of course, we know attack and defense is an arms race. All to say these things are quite complicated and there's no easy answers. 
I appreciated that the book didn't shy away from America's efforts to dominate in cyber war and all the hypocrisy of all the players in the game. As we all know, anytime some politician says, especially in a global sense, this other country is horrible for doing this and we would never do that, eh, they've often done it. They have, sometimes they did it first. For example, while many were concerned about Huawei, if Huawei gets too integrated into the networks and the 5G of various different countries, then when the Chinese Communist Party you know, activates them in some way, then they'll get more information and so on. Not to say this is not a legitimate concern. Very few, though, have mentioned that the U.S. was hacking Huawei's systems so that the U.S. would have access to more data when Huawei is then in those subsequent countries, which then just shows how a mess this is, and it doesn't seem there's any angels in this fight. It just depends which side you're on and what you think might be more valuable to your team, if you're a nationalist. Now, Sanger hopes that something like an arms reduction treaty can be signed before things get increasingly worse. If you know people, this seems a bit ridiculous. That said, we do have a nuclear arms reduction treaty. Whether people actually follow it, who's to say? There are fewer weapons than there used to be, although the scale of their power may be a bit different. And this was done for biological weapons, which people tend to use a lot less, if uh, very little, in war. So it's not that it's unthinkable, and it may be for the best. It's one of these game theory collective action problems that is pervasive in all of human history. Also, I thought it was interesting that the U.S. has the best capabilities on Earth, but it also has the most to lose. It's sort of like my, my rough analogy here that I used to have an old crappy car, and if something happened to the car, like it got scratched or I backed up into something and got a dent, I didn't care. It didn't matter at all. Like, well, one, one more, it doesn't really matter. But as soon as I got a new car, like, oh, I care a lot. So it's nice to have nice things, but yeah, now you're more susceptible to attack. And the great asymmetry might be comparing the U.S. and North Korea. In this case, North Korea has very little to lose. As someone said, how do you turn the lights off in North Korea, given that they rarely have electricity? First, there's not even that many entry points into attacking North Korea. You'd have to kind of go through China, which the United States clearly doesn't want to do. And the citizens are in such a weird state, given how they see their leader and the fact that they lack a lot of basic, what we would consider basic necessities and electronic infrastructure, it's not clear what you would do. But from North Korea's point of view, okay, you have this very large, impressive country, the United States, and if you get, say, 6,000 talented hackers, you can cause a lot of damage, and it's not easy for the United States to respond to it. Now, supposedly, this book will be turned into an HBO documentary, so if you like images instead of just words, you can consider waiting for that. Well, I thought it was a pretty good book. Overall, although Sanger has made some errors in reporting on North Korea, as most people have in the West, to be fair, I think this book is interesting and important, and it's a great start for the topic. Well, if the idea of the great global powers constantly attacking each other through cyber war, and the fear that one day your electrical grid and water supply may be cut off causes you anxiety... Well, perhaps you just need some mindfulness meditation. Nice segue, Darren. Thanks, Darren. So the second book I'm going to talk to you about today is called McMindfulness, How Mindfulness Became the New Capitalist Spirituality by Ronald E. Purser. Like any book, the reader or listener's background highly influences the experience of a book. As such, I think this book would be good if you currently think there aren't any problems with mindfulness because the book is critical of mindfulness in various ways. Alternatively, if you already have concerns with mindfulness, this may only be decent and not give you too much that is new. When he isn't focused on complaints about the neoliberal order and the need for collective action, Purser makes an important observation. If the goal of mindfulness is adapting your mind to the present moment, accepting things for what they are, how do you still create change to make the world better? Now, if you aren't experiencing some sort of negative emotion, why would you change anything? I'm very sympathetic to this view because years ago I came up with the idea of pursuing acceptance without apathy. And of course, if anyone fully succeeds at this, let me know. But just to elaborate, you could imagine if you're, the source of your suffering is external, you could say systemic, racial, sexual biases and discrimination, or even just how society is constituted, then trying to become at peace with it doesn't seem to motivate you to take action to then change this systemic societal structure. That seems to make sense on the face of it. At the same time, if you are experiencing something like chronic pain, which largely is your own issue, meaning it's internal to you, and society can't do much to help you aside from perhaps giving you some medication, you have to find some way to manage that. And that's a very different case than someone on the outside attacking you. But, of course, things are on a continuum and nothing's black and white. So you can imagine a case where you are experiencing, say, for example, systematic oppression, and you're trying to fight it, but at the same time, you can't stress yourself out about it all the time because you'll go crazy and perhaps be less productive. As such, maybe you do need some manner of calming your anxiety and thinking about to focus on. And we know people who care a lot suffer from stuff like compassion fatigue just because there's so much suffering in the world and you can only think about it and feel about it so much. 
So I think that's a very important point that most people don't even acknowledge when they're trying to do mindfulness stuff. It's really more about how do I calm myself down and not thinking about any broader context about what's going on. Additionally, I liked his examinations of the absurdity and hypocrisy of corporate mindfulness and military mindfulness. I thought these were very appropriate. It's like, well, okay, so you are in business and you might be just trying to make money and you care mostly about profit, not about, say, the lives and well-being of others. And then you're just going to feel more relaxed about, you know, trading stocks and not caring about other people. That's at least how he sees it. Of course, most people in business are not evil, but there are people who are a bit more nefarious. And how we might interact with them and how we might deal with their actions is a relevant point. The military mindfulness is also an interesting thing because making people more efficient killers doesn't really seem to be an aligned goal of Buddhism. Uh, and this is also then related to whether you can separate mindfulness practice from its Buddhist social ethical context. Now, I, in general, actually don't mind taking pieces of things and seeing if they're relevant and if they help you in your life. That's great. I'm not uh, one to say that, oh, well, if it's not exactly like it was when it was original or created, that's, you know, arguments to antiquity or how other people do things or some sort of essentialism, the no true Scotsman's fallacy, all these different things like that's not the true Buddhism. That's not the true mindfulness. Well, nothing's really the true thing. There's different schools, there are different variants, there's different people and how they practice these things. So what matters most is whether something is useful to you. That said, it does seem a bit problematic if we're trying to have a more relaxed, unified, peaceful, appreciative, because that's often a part of mindfulness, but I'm showing my own bias, uh, appreciative world, and then other people are becoming more efficient killers. Unless you're more relaxed and you're a more efficient killer, but then you can use that to make the world a better place. Ah, uh, the complexity of the world. All that to say is, I think it's an important issue also, but when you think of all these mindfulness retreats that a lot of corporations are going on, or even in the military, uh, they're not focusing on the ethical issues at all. In fact, some practitioners are asked to teach mindfulness in a military setting and told they're not supposed to bring up ethics at all. For those who are a bit unaware, there is a very famous mindfulness practitioner called John Kabat-Zinn. He runs a stress and pain reduction clinic, and he is one of the people at the forefront of the movement, and he gets a lot of attention in the book, mainly critical attention. And so the idea is, are practitioners like Kabat-Zinn appropriating Eastern exoticism to make money, or realizing that they have to compromise to get a Western audience to accept any of these messages? Probably both, or either, depending on who it is. So in the book, he'll highlight that kabat says A in one domain and B in another, where sometimes he seems to talk about Buddhism and he wants the cachet of Buddhism, but other times he'll speak more scientifically. And depending on if you want to give him the benefit of the doubt, he's either a bit of a weasel, kabat or he's thinking tactically and thinking, okay, because I'm a scientist, I can use this language in this domain to have these people understand what it is, but I can't just talk about the Dharma to many people because they'll completely tune out. And so a lot of that really has to do with how much you might trust someone. Trust someone who's making a lot of money off these things. In different parts of the book, Purser highlights that there just isn't any good evidence that indicates mindfulness practice is better than exercise or other relaxation techniques. I think this is very important, and we should stop acting like mindfulness is obviously good. Certainly, if you are stressed out, and you do some breathing for 10 seconds, 30 seconds a minute, and then you feel better, and that's a true thing in the world, we'll say it's not just a biased observation, that seems to have some value, independent of whether you're not really helping the nature of the world and society. But I would say that one should try to evaluate why this might be better than something else. It's very hard to do any double-blind clinical controlled trials of mindfulness, precisely because you don't know what people are doing when they're sitting, thinking, or not thinking on their own. In medical settings, you can give someone a placebo. You know someone has taken the pill or not, and that's why you have a controlled study. With mindfulness, you can tell one group to think this way or focus on the breath, and you can tell another group to do something similar but kind of fake or a sham version, but you don't really know what they're doing, so it doesn't really help the results. Additionally, they rarely do a control group where someone's watching 20 minutes of their favorite comedy show, someone's done an extra 20 minutes of exercise, someone just uh, tried to have a 20-minute nap. So I think all these things could be just as valid, and you don't necessarily need mindfulness, but now mindfulness seems to be everywhere. Now, I didn't focus too much on the beginning of the review, as I didn't want it to carry too much weight, but if one is going to read or listen to this book, one has to be prepared for a lot of anti-capitalistic and anti-individualistic views. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be a bit more collective, or not, uh, but the Western world is highly individualistic, and it isn't at all clear that that is the wrong move or the wrong way to be. There are pros and cons to everything, including socio-political structures. Now, Purser would have had a stronger case if he did some analysis about different societies instead of intermittent complaints about the neoliberal order and individualism in the West. 
I think the book could probably have been edited to remove almost all those complaints, and it would still be a worthwhile, if not more, focused and streamlined book. I can appreciate the value of markets, and still think mindfulness is often a scam, or at least misunderstood. I couldn't help but notice that Purser seems to at least address the issue that I highlighted before, not accepting what you perceive as injustice. The joke response would be to tell him to relax and focus on his breath, but he does make useful criticisms, and as such, I think there is some value in this book. Until next time, think better, to act better. For show notes, or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries, or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast.